Time for another Columbia block game. This time it is Richard the Third, the War of the Roses. It's a little darker in here, and um, I might get interrupted frequently because my toddler daughter is over in the corner trying to get her to sleep. So, uh, but yeah, I haven't played this one. Um, yet. I've had it for a little while. Um, as far as the chronology goes in the sort of Hammer of the Scots system, I believe it's um, Hammer of the Scots, obviously, and then um, Crusader Rex, I think, was the next one by the same designer, and then this one was after that. And then Julius Caesar by a different designer um, came after that one. <clears throat> And um, realizing that uh, Julius Caesar got a lot of its ideas from Crusader Rex, I think, and a few from this one as well. So this is part of the Hammer of the Scots system, if you will. Uh, there are quite a few similarities, but a number of differences. And I think those differences are going to be um, very evident. Um, the, they seem kind of minor, but I think knowing Hammer the Scots as well as I do, that they're going to make a pretty big impact. Now, I'm not sure what edition this is. Um, something I don't like about Columbia boxes is their editions. Um, they don't have their editions on the boxes. But I think this was called The War of the Roses at some point, and then it was republished as Richard III, I want to say. Uh, let's see what version of the rules I'm using, though. It's the most recent fact they might be in another room because I was reading them separately. I'll have to look that up. But let's go over a few of the differences. Um, first of all, you'll notice that there's only the Lancastrians on the side of the board. And this is the War of the Roses, the English Civil War. Uh, if you're not familiar with that period of history, York, uh, White versus Lancaster, the same conflict that um, Blood and Roses depicts, which I played on my channel earlier. Uh, but this is more of a strategic level game, not tactical. Um, so yeah, it's these two different families, dynasties, um, trying to get control of the crown of England, basically. We start the game with Henry VI as King of England, um, but the Duke of York wants to usurp that. And it's all very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of Edwards. I've, I've just kind of started getting into the history of the thing, um, of this particular time period. So I cannot claim to be an expert. But the differences. Um, let's see. Let's talk about the similarities first. The combat works very similarly. Uh, the blocks, you'll notice, are quite similar in terms of steps, but these also have a few, uh, that's a bad example, but mm, this one, for example, you'll notice a few new numbers. Um, this number is to see if he will switch sides, basically. So in Hammer of the Scots, if you killed someone, they switch sides. There was a card that did it as well. And this time, if you have the King, the Pretender, or Warwick, and I think maybe some of the church blocks can do it too. Uh, you can actually make a roll instead of attacking to try and switch them to the other side. And if the noble gets killed in combat, they die. Um, they don't switch sides. So there's a bit of, you know, similar thing of switching of the sides, but it's handled quite differently. The map is gorgeous. Um, I'm not sure in this low light how well you can see it, but in the future videos it'll be a bit brighter. But this is probably the prettiest of the Columbia Games map, and one of the prettiest war game maps in general. Um, it's it's a little busy. There's a lot of different symbols on it, but it's all pretty straightforward. Basically, as in Hammer of the Scots, if they're defending their home area represented by their standard most times. Okay. <laughs> she needs more. I'll be right back. Okay, where was I? Um, yeah, the various standards, uh, the shields, the heraldry, shows their home areas, and they can have multiple home areas. Um, 
and like for example you know we have this here but we also have it up here if they're defending that they get their um their value goes up by one uh, it's another you know there are borders that you're going to be crossing via movement it's the same kind of thing where you play a card that has most of them have movement points and you can move a number of groups of blocks uh, one or two spaces all these have the same movement rating whereas in hammer of the scots it was a little different <clears throat> um, but again they can split um, there are three different types of borders this time. We have blue, we have red, and we have yellow. I believe four units can go over yellow, three for blue, and two for red, and they must stop. I'll have to double check that, but I think that's how it works. Um, another difference is in the win condition. So this is a much shorter game, or at least it looks to be. You get seven cards in a hand instead of Hammer of the Scots is five. And you only play three s campaigns, basically, um, because they're not years. The War of the Roses was a much different situation. It happened over uh, many years, but there were several long breaks in between. So that means this one, seven times three, is 21 cards that will be played versus Hammer of the Scots, which is five times, I think that last... 10 years, so 50, so this should be about half uh, as long, just, you know, a rough guesstimation, I haven't actually played it yet. But to win, you need to kill all of the opponent's heirs, um, possible heirs to the throne, and they all have these little crowns on them up in the upper left there. If you manage to do that, you get an instant victory, if not... Then at the end of the third campaign, whoever has the most nobles in England um, wins, basically. There's wintering. Um, it's, it's not really wintering, it's more of an attrition check in this. And that'll happen more frequently than in Hammer of the Scots. And everything kind of resets between campaigns, kind of like the wintering in Hammer of the Scots. Uh, you can play these as separate campaigns if you really want a very short game. And they have some different scenarios for that if you wanted to start on, say, the second or the third one, for example. So, um, a few differences. You'll notice Lancastrians are the only ones in England right now. Um, Yorkists are all in exile. So we'll be making sea moves, basically. Kind of like moving from England to Scotland uh, to get our troops into England and if we're able to kill the uh, opposing king then the next king down the line you know takes his place and so on and so forth now there is a way oh at the end of every campaign there's also a check to see if you have the most nobles on the board then of your color then you become king then the other side becomes the pretender um, they each have their own bonuses. The Pretender, for example, gets these Rebels that they can recruit. I forget exactly what the King's um, benefits are. Well, um, the King and his royal heirs get defending bonuses wherever there's a crown on the map, and there are several of those around. Um, you can see them here. I actually wish they were more like this crown, um, a little more cartoony rather than this red and gold they're a bit harder to see in that case yeah I'm just rambling at this point it's been a long day uh, there's some mercenary troops you have Scots you have Irish you have French um, also Welsh all the Wales is broken up into separate regions on this uh, another big difference is so because there's no wintering um, instead of spending points for movement Something else also is, you'll notice the event cards also have movement points on them that are used for the event. Um, but in any case, so let's say you played this, right? You can split this three up and use all three for movement, or you could use two for movement and one for recruit, three for recruit, however you want to split it up.
when you recruit someone, they come in at full strength. And you pick from them face up in front of you. And they have certain restrictions as to where they can go. Um, you know, London skirmishes, for example, um, go to London as long as you control it. And there's a few different rules and such as to what can go where. Mm -hmm. But you have a much greater choice. And they come in at full strength. There is no healing of blocks um, during, like, the actual fighting of it. Things reset, like I said, after the seven cards are played. <clears throat> but there's no... Um, it's much different than the wintering is in Hammer of the Scots. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, there's also some different units that we haven't seen before. Uh, now the Age of Gunpowder, we have these Bombard units. D3, which is quite bad. Uh, they're very slow, but they are an A3 on the first round of combat. I wish there was something to indicate that as well. Something else that there isn't to indicate is some of the blocks, um, when they die, go back into the pool. Where some of them, if they die, they're out of the game completely. And uh, I think Warwick is one of those that if he dies, he's out of the game completely. I wish that was indicated on the blocks as well. I'll probably put a black cross on them to indicate that at some point. But that's not how it is right now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's you know different enough, I think. Oh, and uh, something else in the combat as well. You can do a knight's charge where the highest ranking officer, and it might only be royal heirs, I'm... Need to double check, but they can do a charge where they can target a specific block and do damage against that. Whereas normally it's the block with the most hit points. However, if they fail, the block that they tried to kill gets a free hit back at them, which is interesting. Uh, something else that's a little different in this is in Hammer of the Scots, the highest strength block takes the hit, and then you see which block is now the highest strength that takes the next hit. Well, in this, let's say you were fighting against these two. This is three, this is two. And you got three hits in um, Hammer of the Scots. It would be boom, boom, and then boom. But in this game, you find out which is the highest, and then all of the hits are resolved on that block. And then once that block dies, and um, the hits, I believe, overrun uh, to the next strongest block. So that's quite different and very interesting. I believe he was in Dorset and he was here. So pretty interesting. This one should be a bit quicker. Um, I need to go find the rules at some point. I also need to stop saying, um, now that I've drawn attention to it, you'll hear it every time. Notice there's some port cities around where we can come in from. Some of these port cities are, actually, I think these indicate that you can bring in two for one movement and I believe since this also has that symbol that means you can bring in two from here to here it says you can only do it from port to port from heavy port or large port or whatever to large port um, to bring in two of them whereas normally you'd only be able to move one so I think this counts as that sort of port so you could bring in two but I needed to double check that that's not actually in the rules that I could see, so I have to check out the FAQs. I printed out a few um, player aids, like this is the combat thing. It just reminds you of some things like, oh, you know, these dudes get plus one firepower if they're in a certain place. Uh, the bombards are at an A3 for the first round. You can do treachery rolls, and it just has a lot of different things here. There's also four units across the yellow borders, like I said before, so this is a nice little thing. I need to get it on better paper at some point. <clears throat> and I print out some FAQs and so on and so forth. But this game is actually seems um, a little simpler, I think. Maybe or about, maybe about the same complexity than Hammer of the Scots, although it does seem shorter. So I don't think it'll be much of an issue. The component quality is also a step up. The cards are actually attractive, unlike my version of Hammer of the Scots anyway. Uh, they're quite nice. Uh, the quality of them isn't great. Um, these are just feel like cardboard, I guess. But they're very nice to look at. The blocks, about the same as Hammer of the Scots, really. These ones seem even chunkier and seem much more evenly cut. Came with some 
white D6s. The map is a harder stock. It's not paper. It's like cardboard. It lays reasonably flat on its own, but got the plexiglass, so I might as well use it. So yeah, I think that's about it as far as the intro of everything goes. I'll kind of explain the rules as I'm playing through the game like normal. But yeah, I think that's it. So hopefully that wasn't too boring and hopefully you can see things in this sort of darkness here and I'll find those rules and get started. All right, and away we go. Let's see how many card plays I can get through before my toddler wakes up. So we do some cards. Something else to note about these cards that I got a little chuckle about. Um, Richard gets a suntan. I don't know how well you can see that, but there's some different coloring on the backs of these cards that I just found hilarious, but it's early in the morning and I find a lot of things hilarious. Uh, so, let's look at the Yorkist hand. Uh, you'll notice the ranges are a little different. We have twos, threes, and fours, rather than ones, twos, and threes like in Hammer of the Scots. We have a couple of event cards here. Force March, which allows a um, us to move three areas. Muster, which is a movement type in Crusader Rex, basically allows us to pick an area and move all blocks within an area to that area. Doesn't help us much though, it'd be much better on the Lancastrian side of things. Uh, because sea movement is not loud and we're all over the sea at the moment. And then a few of these, which would be much more helpful, I think. Now, looking at the rules in the FAQ, it doesn't specify. It just says movement from a major port to another major port that has the ship symbol can move two blocks per movement point instead of one. Now I'm assuming that in France and in Kilius that there are major ports somewhere and that's where they would be coming from. So that's how I'm going to play it. And it has to be within C zone to C zone. So the English channel here only does this. Um, we can come in on the Irish Sea over here and then there's also the North Sea. And from what I can tell, the North Sea is only from coast to coast, basically. That's not somewhere we can come off map and get on from. I'm trying to figure out how to do something about the glare. Um, I've got, you know, overhead lights. Uh, this is actually a gaming room that my wife was kind enough to build for me. It's a bit messy at the moment. But um, I turned a basement that was unfinished. Uh, she turned it into this room for me. Quite nice. Uh, very messy computer and such. But um, all these lights are dimmable and such, but um, they do create some glare here. And that's uh, not so much of a problem while I'm playing, but I think it's distracting on the video. So I'm trying to figure out some way to deal with that other than just turning off the lights. I don't know. In any case. I'm gonna be a bit rambly this morning, I can tell. All right, so, well, obviously we need to do some sort of sea movement, I think, first of all. Obviously, right? Now the question is, what is our target going to be? Well, we gotta have a th three crowns here, Cornwall, Somerset, and Henry himself, which are our obvious targets, I think, starting off. Um, we can get to Somerset or Exeter, via movement with this. And we have some very good blocks. Um, just tremendous quality as far as these archers march and um, the Calius, Calias mercenaries are concerned. So I'm thinking of bringing this sort of group here maybe. Move over. This sort of group here. Over and maybe landing in Dorset or something like that. Or maybe moving to Sussex as sort of our, our landing area. Actually, that is something I do need to look up, is can you see move into an enemy place? And if you do, um, is it... Do each subsequent block come in as reinforcements? Because it, it acts a lot like 
moving from England to Scotland does in Hammer of the Scots. And in that game, although each block took in its own individual movement point, when they moved into a combat, they were all part of the same force. So I do wonder if that is the same. Okay, you can only see move to friendly or vacant coasts. So that solves that issue. Right? Well, I think... Um, I mean, Sussex is a bit exposed. We know they don't have the muster card, so they can't just come on at us all at once. Uh, Kent, well, everything can move two blocks, so I don't think there's really anything to say about it. We just want to move first so they don't block our entry, I think, is the big thing. Because, yeah, if they moved... Well, okay, I guess they can move him over to here. There's no way for them to block... Oh yeah, there is. So they can move this here and then this here, and then they would completely block our entry into the country, wouldn't they? We'd have to move in um, up north there. So that's something that we want to avoid, I think. I think we want to make a strong showing down here, first of all. So we're going to play a four. And then moving over to the uh, Lancastrian side of things. And by moving, I mean leaning far over the table and taking the cards. Um, hmm, what do we have? Well, we have twos and threes, and a couple of interesting, whoa, treason, uh, move one group and then a treasure roll can be made before the battle begins, any battle, so it doesn't have to be the one that you moved, which is interesting, but we know, we know there's not going to be a battle this time unless we start it, because they're going to be moving in, so yeah, probably not what we need. That's, hmm. It's a much more difficult question, I think, for the Lancastrians, because we have to decide, okay, where do we think they're going to land? Are we going to oppose the landing? Oh, no, actually, no, it's quite simple for us, isn't it? Uh, we're just going to bring in reinforcements. So, yeah, let's uh, play our three, and then we'll reveal. Yorkus will go first, and then the Lancastrians. Um, let me... Look up here. <clears throat> this is various restrictions as to where you can actually recruit things. I wish there was a player aid for that. That would be very useful. In fact, I'm surprised I don't have one. I printed out most of the player aids from Board Game Geek, but I don't think that was one of them. Maybe it's simpler than I'm making it out. That's entirely possible. Touchdown. Where is recruitment? Well, I guess I'll put a break in this while I look it up. All right, so looking up sea moves a bit more. Um, blocks in Calius can move sea move in areas of the English Channel or the North Sea, which should be indicated. Oh, it is. I'm an idiot. It's right here on the. Yep, yep, good design that. <clears throat> but it doesn't say, it says a block can see move two blocks for AP1 when moving from one major port to another major port. Both blocks must start at the same and end and move to the same one. It says major port is defined in 2.83. All coastal areas contain minor ports, but several contain a major port. Ports improve sea movement. <sighs> so it doesn't... Because the thing is, if I assume that that is the case, I have four here. I can bring in eight blocks. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's everything I've got, plus some. Is that the intent of being able to move everything in at once? Maybe it is. I'm not sure. I mean, it has the ship symbol, right? So, because it does, I'm going to say that that's how it works. So, we move in two for one movement point. So, that's eight. So, I can bring in all these and almost all of those up there as well uh, from Ireland <clears throat> if I so desired. Now, the other thing I can do, and I believe that this is fine, is I can, um, yeah, it should be actually. I can move someone in at a place and then use some points to recruit as well. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of recruiting rebels to Oxford here. 
uh, first off because they can only go to a vacant area. They're quite a good block, really. And that gives them something to deal with other than my invading force. So I think I will actually do that. I'll bring in some rebels in Oxford here. I could uh, move them further north, but I think that's fine. So we'll start with that. And then, so that's one of the... So now I have three, which is six. So let's let's move all this in, I think. Uh, we can only have four per. Once we get to the supply phase, we'll have to take some losses. I have much more trouble. It's, you know, probably just because I don't have... This is my first time playing this, whereas Hammer of the Scots I've played uh, several times. So, but this rule book, I, for eight pages, right? So, for example, uh, let's say, what was I just looking at? Uh, recruit, right? So it says, hey, you can recruit here. But it doesn't have the number, the section uh, for recruitment. So it could very easily just say, hey, look at 5.4. Oh, it does, but it's not bolded. You think it would be bolded or put in parentheses or something. Maybe it's just early morning and I'm having more trouble than usual. Uh, what was I even looking for? Right, um, with supply phases. Yeah, it says 7.0. So... I'm pretty sure it's four. Up to four blocks without penalty. All right, so let's take March, I think, into Sussex, along with the A Force, if you will. And then we'll take the rest of that lot into Kent. So that is one. Ah, oh, they have to go to the same place, don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, well, we'll really make this the the force. So that's one, two, three, and four. I think that's the best use of my movements. Although, do we go one at a time in this one? We don't, do we? Player one and then player two. I am fairly certain that it's the same in this as it is in Hammer, where you must resolve all of the movements before the other player goes. So with that in mind, then, we have a three. Let's walk around the table. It's a new game, also. I was going to do an unboxing of that, but this was in the way, so I don't have to wait. And it's driving me crazy. It's my first Great Battles game. Very excited. Uh, da, da, da. Right, so let's um, let's get some let's get some recruitments. I think so. Um, London seems an obvious option, and. Do we not have London Garrison? I suppose not. I thought there was. Maybe that's on the other side. Um, so Bombard is something we could put in. And then who else would we like? <clears throat> Gotta look at the board. So this is London. Doesn't have any noble flags that I can tell. But London is white. And that means any Yorkist can go there? I know the, um... Well, that would be Yorkist in any case, wouldn't it? Maybe that just says which side the garrisons can be on. But I know having the name of a place in white mean, or red means something. Uh, it's a very well designed map in that, in that there's a lot of information on it, including which seas they can go on, which I just missed. Right. So, hmm. So is Bombard the only one we could bring in, then? 
We can't bring them in and move them at the same time. That is not allowed. Maybe we just want to get in as much as we can. Salisbury should be down here somewhere. The good thing about playing these games and Pendragon is it's vastly improved my knowledge of Scottish and English geography. Let's see, Salisbury Shield. He's got this sort of dragon thing going on. No, this is a ram rampart lion. I think that's the term for it. He should be there. This is where, I mean, this is the town of Salisbury here. Uh, thank you, Pendragon, for telling me that. But that doesn't match his shield. That's interesting. His shield is up here. Um, South York, of all things. Well, that confuses me. I'm sure the English watching this video are like, well, duh, you stupid idiot, but a bit surprising. Um, hmm. He's not actually all that good. An A1 is quite terrible. Well, I'm going to have to think about these, I think, and then I'll come back. All right, well, I think I'll bring in um, Bristol, Buckingham, and Coventry. So Bristol will be heading down here in Somerset. Buckingham in Glamour again. Can't read it from this way. And then Coventry here in Warwick. All right, so that gets us a few more blocks, I suppose. And then, yeah, we'll just go back and forth. Um, pretty quick playing as far as the turns go. And I'll be back. All right. Well, I'm thinking that we move in to try and attack Henry with this group. Maybe moving this group up to, say, here, just to um, maybe try and convert him with Warwick here. Maybe. And then using the third to recruit Suffolk here in Oxford. So that means we need a three. Now, of course, we have our other lot up there in Ireland that we could be bringing in. But I think we'll save them for now. We've got a lot of movement that needs to happen here. So I think three is appropriate there as well. Let's see who, um, who wins on ties. I guess would be the Yorkist. Well, that's right. If um, a side has 13 points or less in movement points in their hand, they're allowed to mulligan. But that's not what I'm looking for. I need to know who's player one. It should be in the action section. I'll have to look a little closer. The pretender wins ties. So that's York in this case. Well, let's do one to get Suffolk here with the rebels. He'll lead that rebel force. And then we can only move three across that border. Which should be fine. Let's go. Hmm. We could put March into some danger by moving him here. That's probably not the best idea, to be honest. Um, well, I don't want to leave him alone either, so I'm actually going to move him 
over to here. Oh, I can move, okay, I can do this. So let's move these three up across the blue border to here. And then these two will move up across the blue and then the yellow border into Essex. And then he can't quite get there but he will reinforce this battle. Okay, now Lancaster gets to react. Well... Do we want to try and hold this? The thing is you have to fight in the first round of combat. Unlike in Hammer of the Scots. We certainly want to get a group of people together. I'm not sure how we can save the king at this point. We could get one person in, but that's not going to do much. So I think really running away is our best option there. And it's probably not the worst thing in the world for us if Henry VI dies anyway. He's a bit useless. Um, the reason his block is... A B2 instead of a C2, the rulebook says, is because they assume uh, Margaret of uh, Anjou is with him. Hmm. So, let's see. We could... I'm thinking getting all of these together in one force is probably our best move. One... Two, then I think we could even, we have a lot of blue borders here, limits our movements. What should the last be? I think I'll actually bring Beaufort down to try and reinforce this battle, give them a fight. Yorkus gets to choose first. I will choose this battle. Not sure we need this or even that I have room for it at the moment. I'll just keep it here to the side. Alright, so the Earl of March is in reserves. This one actually came with two spare blocks I could be using to represent where we're fighting, but I'll put it here. A lot of the important battles actually happened here. We have the first and second battle of St. Albans and the battle of Barnet. So three very important battles. St. Albans was the first battle, the first major battle in the conflict. Okay, so A's go first, and we have quite a few of them. Let's roll for Kent. That's going to be three dice. It's on ones or twos. We can't convert Henry VI. That's two hits. Quite lucky. Now finishing him off with some crossbowmen. Only one. He does get to go. He cannot run away on the first. So he'll get to roll one and hit on one, twos, or threes. Because he's in London, which is a crown city. That hits. So I have my option as to where it goes. Um, these are all quite good to be honest, but I'm going to take it on Kent, I think. And then we have these mercenaries here for the last hit. So he is dead, I think. Let's see what happens for battle. Eliminated blocks. The king is dead, long live the king. The senior royal heir becomes king at his current location, uh, beginning at the next supply phase. The location of the new king must be announced. So there's no, not going to be a king until we get to the supply phase of this round, which will be coming very shortly. Heirs are permanently eliminated when killed. 
so I keep them off map. So he is gone. Um, Rose nobles are permanently eliminated. Other nobles go to the owner's pool face down. They cannot be recruited in this campaign, but could switch. So it says Neville blocks Kent, Salisbury, and Wal Walrick, which are these ones here, are permanently killed. Okay, so roses or the Warwick blocks. Very good. So yeah, that says Margaret here on his block as well. So that's um, King Henry the Sixth. Didn't last long. And now we get to regroup. We didn't even get to bring in the Earl of March. Hmm. Well, I think um, we're gonna all move into here. I don't see any reason to hold London necessarily. We could regroup about perhaps and try to block off some of these retreats. Uh, we can't reinforce this battle. That's part of our regroup, so we have to move. And I'm fairly certain that's the case. In Crusader Rex, I believe that's different. But in this, yeah, never to an enemy or contestant. Uh, well, so... I am going to move everyone into Oxford. Oh, no, i got to be careful about supply. We'll keep everyone in middle six. That's fine. All right, now we'll do this one. Um, he came in as reinforcements. Warwick will try and convert him on his turn. Oh, no, he's a rose block. I can't. That's a shame. Well, in any case, Oxford gets to go first. Rolling three dice, hitting on one, twos, or threes. Necessarily need to take it off map. That's going to be no hits. He's not in the battle yet, so let's do Warwick with four. That'll be two hits. He's not in yet, so it all goes on him. Salisbury here. That'll be the last. Oxford is dead. He's coming in. I don't think there's anything special in this of everyone dying before the chance of regroups happens. Or um, reserves, let's see. They arrive at start of round two and take normal turns. Yep, there's nothing special, so it seems. Uh, so, since he would go first, he could retreat, and I think I will make him retreat, actually. I believe he can go anywhere. I should probably check that as well. Yeah, doesn't seem to matter. As long as he doesn't come in where they came in from. So I'm actually going to bring him up to here to try and regroup up at Coventry. Okay, that's that turn. So now this counts as supply, doesn't it? Yes. Um, everyone is fine in supply, but we do have a new king. And the new king is going to be... Is it Somerset here? Exeter? Hmm, I forget how to tell. I thought it was had something to do with these numbers. I can't quite remember. <clears throat> They're ranked from one senior to five juniors, so the lower numbers first. I would have thought the number two would be on, but I guess not. He must be off map at the moment. So that would make uh, Exeter here king. And we have to declare that. Okay, well, what's next? I'm looking at muster for the moment. Try and get everyone in. So this is our next target, then. I'm trying to think what to do with the Lancasters. They 
possibly need to go on the defensive. Wow, moving this up here. The only problem is the problem of supply. It's difficult to keep a big defending force because supply is the same everywhere as far as I can tell. There isn't any difference between the places. Now supply isn't terrible, it's just um, any surplus blocks take a single step hit. So it's not the end of the world, but still something we would rather avoid if possible. We might need to do some more recruitments on our side of things, or maybe try some treason rolls. Um, there's no one on this side, though, that will treason. I think this is the only one. Kent, uh, that Warwick symbol means Warwick can flip him, but Warwick's on his side, so. Hmm. In fact, there's not very many on the board that will switch. It's mostly in the pools. Well, I'm going to have to think about how the Lancastrians are going to get out of this mess. Okay, well, York is going to play a 2. And Lancaster is going to play a 3. Lancaster is going to try and move. I'm going to take up to here, to here, and to here. So we're quite the force there. Now with R2, we have the problem of these blue lines here. So I'm thinking about recruiting Norwick and Norfolk up there, and then maybe moving them towards this direction. Mm, this might be a bit far to try and reinforce these guys. I think we're going to be having some major battles here next round. If not, what else do we do with the two? We could strike now against these. The only problem is we can only cross three. Although we could come around this way, can't we? Yeah, let's try and do something like that then. So I'm actually going to bring over this as the main force. We can only bring over three. So this will be the main force, and then this will be reserves like this. I believe they come in at the same round. Well, no, I would have had to activate those first. Since he came in there, he would be reserves, and then, but I think they come in in the same round, so I think that's fine. All right, so let's try and get this one. So here's our Lancastrians. This is our main force of Yorkists. And then we have some reserves here. Okay. So the Yorkists are the aggressors. So that means the A's go first. And we were attacking here. Let's um, find a marker of some kind. Let's this and they were here so he is defending at one higher but it is not a crown location so he does not so that's three no hits now to him he hits on threes one hit I will take it here oh he was a B these should have went first so Three, six, one hit, two, three, four hits. Uh, so one hit happens first, and then four hits happens again. We do the strongest, so one, two, three, and then it overruns to four. That's the first round done. We're at the second round. They are going to flee. And he will certainly have a chance to. 
And I'm going to bring him back to Beaumont. However, he's going to get shot at first. And probably not going to survive. Three from the Earl of March. That's going to hit and actually kill him. Because he is a Lancastrian red flower there, red symbol. Um, he dies. Okay, well, hmm. We can reposition. I'm trying to think of what is the best positioning here. Three can go across the blue border, so I will do this. And then for the rest of these, I could leave them here in wilts. So I move them back across. Uh, the other option would be to maybe come to Sussex, meet up with this force over here. I'm trying to think of the reasoning as to why I would want to keep certain locations. I suppose uh, to bring in reinforcements, wouldn't I? So I will keep them here because we do have this Salisbury block that we could use to bring in a reinforcement. So that seems sensible to me. Now for the next one. So this can come over here with a four. And treason isn't going to do us any good. Again, I the blocks would be facing the way I wouldn't necessarily know, but I've I've seen the blocks in that force at this point. So I definitely want to hit here and do as much damage as possible, I think, coming in from both ways. So the only way I can do that is with a two. So that's what we're going to do. Probably should be playing a little more defensively on the Lancastrian side of things. All right, and then... Hmm. What to do? Well, I think using a two to build up some of those reinforcements. All right, so Pretender goes first. Can we bring anyone in Oxford? Uh, how do we bring in our gunners, our bombard troops? In any friendly city. So that will be one of them, I think, for four. And then we'll do Salisbury here for another. We'll let them take the initiative. And they will, I think, make this attack. It seems reasonable to me. So four will come in as the main force. And then four on the defender side. This is an A3 for the first round. We must try and remember that. So we're going to hit hard first here. All right, so let's do the bombards. That's two hits. Two. It's nice having these high hit point blocks to block those first ones. Ah, now this is interesting. Let's go ahead and do, hmm, I would say let's do the rebels, but let's try and take Buckingham in this case. So we have a royal heir here who instead of attacking can roll his dice and try and take, in this case, Buckingham. He will attempt to do that, um, and to do so he rolls the number of dice in the upper left hand corner here, and even he gets it, odds, all odds, he doesn't. That is an odd, so he does not. And that's his attempt for the round. I think actually he can attempt that three times though. But once it happens, it can't like flip back to the other side. Now it's time for the rebels. That's one hit, uh, which must be applied here. And now their A's go. And he has the same option, but there's no one in this case that he can flip. So he'll just have to roll to hit. And no hits, not surprising. Okay, now we are on B's, which is just this gentleman as far as the Yorkist go. That's gonna be two hits. Um, this guy's a bit worthless, but we don't wanna lose any more errors if we can help it. Um, these can also do charges. Let's look up the charge rules. 
I think those are only royal heirs. But those might be nobles as well. Let's see. Hair charges. The senior heir present in each battle at the instance of fire has the option to charge. Yep. As surplus hits are forfeit. Okay, so that'll be an interesting choice coming back around. So now that it's uh, the second round, we have some reinforcements. Let's move these guys over, get them in initiative order here. So things look quite a bit different now, especially since he is now a D3. Hmm. Fight or flee. We've done a considerable amount of damage. And considering we have the option of charges... We could focus on, say, Devin, for example, knock him out. I mean, if we're able to do some damage, we have two royal heirs here for the Lancastrians. We could really mess them up rightly. We're going to go first for quite a few blocks for seven, and um, we have a pretty good chance of hitting. So we're actually going to stay. We're going to roll three for March. I don't think... Is there any reason of charging? The only thing I might consider is charging one of these. But I don't want the free hit back is the thing. So I'm just going to fight as normal. It's only going to be one hit. And we'll take it here. Now for the rebels. Hopefully they fare a bit better. They do not. No hits. Mm. All right, let's see what these guys can do. And they have the same option. They can try and charge something down, but they don't necessarily want that free hit either at this point. Hey, he got a hit, actually. Uh, he is going to be one higher, we must remember. So we'll take that here. Somerset. Uh, hit. Oh, the rebels should have taken it. Okay, that's that. Now we're on to RBs. So he's hitting on threes. Two hits. Ouch. And now for their Bs. Two. One and two. I might as well just roll them all because they all. Hit. Oh no, it needs to be separate. Uh, one hit. One hit. No hits. And then Coventry. One hit. Now for the Bombards, we could retreat them, but might as well have a hit here. Yeah, there's one. Okay, so this is the third round of combat. We um, have to hold out to four for them to force retreat. But now that the idea of a targeted charge is very uh, appealing, so I think that we're going to have a go at that. Okay. He would be first, so we are going to charge him. Trying to get a kill here. And we do it. He is dead. The king is dead. Long live the king. Alright, we have two here for the rebels. That's another hit. Kevin Tree will take it. He gets to go. Let's make sure he stays here. Uh, that's a hit. We'll take it on the bombardiers. And then we did the rebels, right? Right, and then we did this. Now for this. He's at threes. Mmm, no hits. How disappointing. And now we are here. So two, one hit. We'll take it on the rebels. One, nothing, 
two, nothing, one, nothing, and the bomb bombard a hit. We'll take it on Devin actually. All right. So, is it we must flee on the fourth round of battle, or let's see, or do we get to fight the fourth and then flee on the fifth? <clears throat> Battles are fought for a maximum of four battle rounds. Attacking blocks must retreat during round four in their normal battle turn. Is this the start of round four? No. Th this is... Let me think. We had one. We had reinforcements come in. An attack. Three. Oh dear. I've lost track. Um, that's another reason to use these. Although, I don't see anywhere here to keep track. On the um, Crusader Rex player mat, there's a a track that you can keep track of which one it's on. Defender box earlier me. Well, in any case, I I that feels like four rounds, so I think they have to retreat on this one. So we are going to get some free hits then. That's going to be a hit. Rebels, nothing. So he gets to go and fly away. He hits on threes. Ooh, two hits. That is devastating, isn't it? And we're going to lose Coventry, but then what? I suppose we'll lose him. I need to figure out what happens to him. I think he dies and gets face down in the pool but I don't know, I'll have to check uh, and then these guys will get to go away okay that was actually we were the ones in Oxford and then these guys retreat back to here All right, let me look up what happens to Buckingham, and then we'll get to the next turn. All right, so the Yorkists played Force March, and the Lancastrians played this to try and um, get these out of Dodge. Unfortunately, this is going to go first. Can move up to three areas and still attack. Um... So they can come around here like this, and that's going to be a big problem for them. Uh, we should have played a, even though it wouldn't have necessarily helped us, we should have played one of these uh, just so we had the op the possibility of going first, uh, but we didn't, so problem for us. All right, now for this, we can't escape because the blocks are pinned down. We can't, we could get the Welsh over to try and help fight this, but this is a lost cause I think it's just it's complete annihilation on our part so let's try and um, get what's left of our royal heirs on as a matter of fact once once royal heirs die um, some of the replacements how do they come on exactly when an heir is killed the senior minor enters play at the beginning of the next supply phase. Royal heirs enter in any friendly or vacant crown area. Pretender heirs enter in either exile area. Okay, so that means they get to come in for free, basically. Good to know. So we'll take care of that, and they'll have some reinforcements in with them, and then I'll come back. Um, this lot will probably all die. I probably won't do that combat. You'll just see the results of it. Okay, so I brought in... Prince Edward and Richmond to South York, and then York, um, the church block, as well as the York garrison in there with my two points. And then this battle happened. Somerset miraculously survived and is now retreating here. 
and these blocks can move about. Um, not sure that that's strictly necessary. We need to make sure we have more nobles on our side of things than the other when it comes around. So we're going to use the rest of our points, try and recruit as many of those as we can. Um, and I think if we can recruit them in, uh, for the most part, uh, neutral areas that have their, yeah, that contain their shield. So we just need to make sure to get as many on the board as we can so we can get that vote for kingship. And then we'll stick Lancastrians out dry in France. Um, yeah, so that's that. Next one, Lancastrians have to play one of these. They have to think that they're, we're coming after Somerset. So in case that does happen, although I think they've they've seen this and they know there's no one in here that's going to switch sides. We could do a surprise and bring in, uh, let's, yeah, let's do treason. It'll give us a move, if nothing else. And then we're going to play, I think, muster on the other side of things. Just want to make sure if both events happen. Um, that the the campaign season doesn't end. I don't think it does. I think they just cancel each other out. That doesn't cancel each other out or anything like that. So, yeah, we're going to play this then. All right, so Lancastrians go first with their treason. I think I'm just going to move Somerset back as far as we can. To Lancaster back here, run him away. And then for us, uh, we want to get some friendly knights on the board, so we're going to bring him in to Sussex. And then I think we'll bring Herbert here, probably. We could bring someone up here into Norfolk. Hmm. I think we'll do that. Okay, that's that. Last ones. Uh, muster and surprise. Well, for surprise, I don't think it matters too much. We can. Yeah, we can't reach anywhere of note is the problem, and we're not going to be going forward because I think we have everything we need. In fact, I don't think we're going to use the muster either. So that's a dead card, and I think this is a dead card as well. So let's see what happens at the end of turn phase. Repeat steps one through four till all cards have been played. Yep, yep. Supply phase, we're all fine. The political turn, here we go. <clears throat> The pretender can usurp the throne. Armies prepare for the next campaign. We must play these in the exact order um, given. So levies, bombards, and Welsh return to the owner's pool. Mercenaries return to their home areas. Rebel blocks disband. So the rebel block is out. Um, levies. These are levies. So he's out. These are mercenaries. These are mercenaries. down. I don't think it matters. Bombards. That's all fine. It uh, doesn't say anything about church, unless those count as levies. Uh, I think they do. I'll check. Uh, but he certainly does. Everything else is fine. Usurption. I should check on that church, actually. Each count as one noble for usurpation, so they stick around. Uh, good to know. All right. Uh, usurpation occurs when the pretender controls a majority of nobles and heirs. Each church block counts as one noble. Occupation of London also counts as one noble. Uh, had I known that, I would have 
use that muster to get someone over here. Let's do that then. Exclude any blocks in the exile, island of man, or the pool. Ties are won by the king. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not as decisive as I thought, but York becomes the king. The former king is disposed and must go to exile as the pretender. Well, the current king is Prince Edward, I think. So he's in France. The pretender and his heirs on map must go into exile. Okay. Nobles church on map go to their own shield slash cathedral, but if enemy occupied, then they go to the friendly pool. Note, Warwick cannot return to Caelius if Lancastrian. Also, he can... can ah, I see that's his symbol. Okay, so nobles go back to their heirs and shields. I'll take care of that. Give me one second. So everyone's moved back. Everyone heals completely. That's done. Move the rebel block to the pretender pool, which is now over on that side of things. And we'll move um, blocks that are not permanently dead face up so they can be recruited again. And a lot of them are completely dead. Um, the Yorkists have not lost a man yet, but the Lancastrian, it's just catastrophic. Devon is dead. Beaumont. Henry the Sixth. Exter, which are two royal heirs of five, so they have three left, and then the game's over. Um, Wiltshire. <laughs> And Oxford are all dead on the Lancastrian. And uh, who's the king? March, the Earl of March. Is the king. And then Buckingham yeah, comes back up. So Buckingham isn't dead. Just, he just ran off. All right, I think that's everything. Then we shuffle 25, uh, the shuffle the cards, deal 7 again, and then we have another go at it. So what's going to happen first is either the Lancastrian royal heirs are going to die, the remaining three of them, or if the Lancastrian somehow managed to kill all five of the Yorkists. Um, if not, then we do three campaigns, and whoever is the king at the end wins. So that kind of should give you a good example on how it plays. I'm going to continue playing on the rest of this, probably not going into as much detail on every campaign here and about. Um, I don't think there's any additional setup between the campaigns. I think it just starts at this point, basically, and continues forth. So, all right. I'll upload this one, and I'll see you guys in the second campaign.